Hello, and welcome to People of the Pod, brought to you by American Jewish Committee. Each week, we take you beyond the headlines to help you understand what they all mean for America, Israel, and the Jewish people. I'm your host, Manya Brashear Pashman. One could easily say the October 7th Hamas invasion and massacre in Israel is one of the most well-documented terrorist attacks in history. Dozens of smartphone cameras and GoPros filmed Hamas terrorists crossing the border between Gaza and southern Israel to murder more than 1,100 soldiers and civilians and kidnap more than 200 others, the deadliest anti-Semitic attack since the Holocaust. But just like the scourge of Holocaust denial, October 7th denial is growing. Mark Weitzman is the Chief Operating Officer of the World Jewish Restitution Organization, a nonprofit that pursues claims for the recovery of Jewish properties lost during World War II. He's also the lead author of the Working Definition of Holocaust Denial and Distortion for the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, known as IRA, and chairs the IRA Working Group on Museums and Memorials. As we approach International Holocaust Remembrance Day, Mark has joined us to discuss how we can make sure the world does not forget or deny any atrocities committed against Jews. Mark, welcome to People of the Pod. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Mark, you are an expert on Holocaust denial and distortion. What does it have in common with the denial we're seeing around October 7th? I think that there are clear connections between people who are downplaying or distorting the events of October 7th, and those that engage in Holocaust distortion or hardcore Holocaust denial, because both are linked by an attempt to try to explain what is for them an uncomfortable historical reality that targeted Jews, whether it's the Holocaust or the events of October 7th, to justify their preconceived political agenda, which often includes an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory either as its base or as its method to achieve their goals. One of the root causes of Holocaust denial and distortion from the anti-Semitic perspective is the attempt to say that since the Holocaust, there is a certain sympathy for Jews as victims, and sometimes that turns into political sympathy or support for the state of Israel. Sometimes it turns into actions that are pro-democracy or anti-racist in terms of society of saying that we've seen what happened at Auschwitz, we don't want our society to go in that direction, so we're going to take certain positive steps. Those people who want to turn the clock back to a world where people could still be judged by their religion, their race, or whatever signifier, uh, often have to grasp with the Holocaust. It, it's, it's the paradigm of what can happen when society turns evil. The same thing, in a sense, is at the root of October 7th denial. It's the attempt to say that, oh no, we don't want to allow any sympathy to Jews or to Israelis. We have to justify it or explain it away in a way that allows us to accept the reality of what had happened because denying it puts you in a really sort of cuckoo cage of denying what's obvious to every one that happened there. So in this sense, in a particular sense, it could be by saying that, oh yeah, it happened there, the Israelis were killed, but they were killed by the government of Israel. The hostages were not really taken to Gaza. They're actually hidden in Israeli buildings or holdings. That, you know, this was all part of a plot by Israel and the U.S. government aimed at undermining the Palestinian narrative and drive for freedom. But the goal there is similar. It's to grapple with a reality that most people would find repugnant, an anti-Semitic reality. The latest poll in the U.S. shows 80% of the U.S. population support Israel versus Hamas. And an attempt to justify their stance, their preordained anti-Semitic stance, they have to deal with that reality. And so you can't ignore it. You can't say it didn't happen, since, as you pointed out, it's one of the most photographed and verified actions in recent memory. So you try to twist it away and turn it on its head. But how do people wrap their heads around this fantasy fiction? These conspiracy theories are linked. And I don't think enough people have realized this or paid attention to it, that Hamas's original charter, 1988, actually quoted, literally quoted the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is, as we all know, the the Bible of conspiracy, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And they literally based 
their charter, it's the only Western document quoted in their charter, their original charter, and it links the events of October 7th with the history of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. This is not an anti-Zionist document, the protocols, it's an anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic document. So there's direct connection there. The Holocaust is the most documented event in human history. But it's not just there are films, there are millions and millions of pages of documents There are so many archival records of survivors, of perpetrators, of war crimes tribunals, judged and entered into evidence the effects of the Holocaust, the reality of the Holocaust, not just in the United States, but look at the David Irving trial, the famous David Irving trial, but all the war crimes trials in Europe as well. To say that it did not happen or to twist it requires an effort of will. And it's not just on the individual level. In our work at the WJRO, We see governments today that do not want to deal with restitution and use manipulation of the Holocaust to try to get out of it by claiming that, again, that it was all the Germans, the local collaborators had nothing to do with it, or that the numbers were inflated, or that we don't know what the value was, what was really owned by Jews at that time, all sorts of methods used to evade trying to make some payment, some form of restitution, and that to survivors. And part of our mission is to set forth and ensure that the historical record, even in terms of the theft of Jewish property, is well established. So when we get to the events of October 7th, particularly in an era where fake news, where people claim to believe all sorts of conspiracy theories, whether it's related to COVID, whether it's related to American election results, and a lot of these people kind of bond together. The underground of election denial and some of the anti-COVID extremists and some of the Hamas or some of the October 7th deniers or distorters, very often they live in the same atmosphere, in the same basement, they imbibe the same fumes. They're in touch with each other. Very often they're cooperating or believe in the similar conspiracy theories. And this is one of the problems that we have as a society, amplified by social media, is to separate the real from the fake and to try to limit and minimize the impact that the fake has on real life, on mainstream society and politics and culture and so on. So as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, International Holocaust Remembrance is January 27th, and you just returned from a meeting with representatives of Holocaust institutions around the world. How did these museums come to be? I mean, was it a bricks and mortar movement to counter Holocaust denial? Was it seen more broadly as a tool to fight anti-Semitism or something else entirely? Well, I think that most of these came to be, first of all, through the efforts of survivors. In so many cases, it was the survivor community that were the driving force behind it. And yes, it was in response to anti-Semitism and to Holocaust denial, but those movements were not, in a sense, the dominant factors that we may think today. It was a sense, I think, more of trying to pass on what they went through, both to the Jewish community, their children and grandchildren and so on, but more importantly to the community writ large, meaning that to the world at large, whether it's the US or the UK or Canada, they wanted people to learn the lessons from what they had gone through and survived. They wanted people not to have to deal with the same things that they dealt with. And it's fascinating to me, one of the most interesting things that I find in the field is that today, not only a majority of visitors to Holocaust museums, the vast majority not Jewish, but the majority of people who work in these institutions are not Jewish either. They're people who have dedicated their lives to some second career, some it's you know career-long commitment to both studying and teaching and passing on lessons of the Holocaust. So what began sometimes within the Jewish community as a survivor-led effort At this point, there are very few survivors still actively involved, especially, you know, on that level. And it's evolved into something that is broader and larger than just the Jewish community. We had your colleague, Rob Williams, at the USC Shoah Foundation join us at the end of last year. And the Shoah Foundation is collecting testimonies from October 7th now. And I'm curious, are other Holocaust memorial institutions developing programs or adding evidence from October 7th to their collections? I think one of the things that came out at the meeting, which was at the Holocaust Museum in Washington about a month ago, was that these institutions are grappling 
with October 7th. And it was very clear. And part of it is that most of these institutions had not tried to be politically based. In other words, they did not conceive of themselves as taking a political stance one way or the other. And the supercharged atmosphere of October 7th, the events of October 7th, the atmosphere post-October 7th caught them, I think, by surprise. And they're still grappling with how to respond and how to react to it. There has been a tremendous amount of interest, of support. It's, you know, USC is leading the way with a tremendous effort of taping the uh, survivor accounts and making them available. But I saw conversations, we had conversations from certain speakers in how to address October 7th, how to deal with anti-Semitism in the wake of October 7th. Because again, these are people who are not necessarily, if you're an expert in the Holocaust, does not necessarily mean you're an expert in what's happening with Israel and Hamas and the Middle East and so on. And it's a very different field, a very volatile field, and they're in a position that they had not anticipated. So I think that there was a shock. There is a strong sense of moral support, moral-based support for Israel and the victims there. There is a strong commitment to, I think, keeping the message of releasing the hostages first and foremost in people's minds, but how exactly to go about it what the best way to achieve those goals is still something I think some of them are, are wrestling with. Some are doing even little things like one museum that I know of has in their gift shop a sort of a small section of Israeli you know, objects for sale that the, the proceeds will go back to some of the communities or some of the people in Israel who have been evacuated or need support. So it could be a small thing like that. It could be educational programs. It could be public statements. It could be hosting events. It could be showing the testimony. It could be learning more about the background that led up to it. There are a lot of potential paths and ways that they're engaging with. And I think each of them are sorting it out and finding their own path right now. But they're in the process of grappling with something that they had not anticipated. And this is somewhat novel for them to have to deal with. Generally, do Holocaust institutions try to avoid Israel or kind of leave Israel out of their exhibitions, their collections, and really focus on the Jewish communities of their particular country? I think it varies. I think that, you know, in a broad sense, they're not necessarily want to be seen up till now, at least as partisans in a political struggle or political battle. But there was clear recognition in so many of them that you can't leave Israel out of the story because you had survivors going to Israel. You had the Zionist youth groups, let's say in the Warsaw Ghetto and other places that helped spearhead some of the revolts. If you ignore those parts of the story of the narrative of the Holocaust, then you're not being true to the history of it. When you show where survivors ended up after the war, certainly a huge number of them, percentage-wise, ended up in Israel. It's one of the you know the prime spots for survivors to go to. Many of them worked with Yad Vashem, for example, and had a relationship there. You have The Righteous Among the Gentiles, which is a story that almost all Holocaust museums want to have some focus on because it's a prime example of non-Jews responding in a positive way in, in the most dire circumstances. But the certification of who is a righteous Gentile came from Yad Vashem in Israel. So there are, you know, inextricably linked to it. But what you didn't, and what they tried to avoid, was taking sort of a partisan position. Should Israel do this action? Should this Israeli government be supported against that Israeli government? Or, you know, so on and so forth. But the broad idea of Israel's right to exist, of Israel as a place of refuge for the survivors, as Israel being a change in the narrative of the history of the Jewish people in the 20th and 21st centuries, all those had to be a part of the story and are dealt with, but in different ways in many of these institutions. So you also traveled to Israel at the end of last year. And I'm curious, up until now, how have Israelis talked about the Holocaust? Is it a cornerstone of their history as a modern nation? Maybe not so much for the younger generations. And could October 7th connect some dots and change that? Well, I led a small mission for the WJRO and we went down south to Kfar Aza and also met with evacuees. And it was an incredibly moving experience. And the reality of what happened there, the going to the exhibition on the Nova Music Festival, is something that I don't think any of us participating will ever forget. And it was interesting because we had two guides from the Israeli army, from the 
spokesperson's office from the Israeli army, two young women who were with us down in Kfar Aza, one of the worst places, and they made the connection. And we had a Holocaust survivor with us as well. And she made the connection. And there was a resolve that, you know, this is something that we didn't think we would ever have to face firsthand, this kind of targeted destruction of Jewish civilian life. I don't think Israelis have fully come to grasp and understandably with the implications of what happened. I think it may take even a generation or two to kind of work this through. But I think that there's no question that hearing over and over again the worst act of violence since the Holocaust gives a frame and a context that is going to keep the Holocaust you know, as part of the conversation about this. Israel, prior to this, there had been a lot of, of efforts. I, I mentioned Yad Vashem earlier, certainly one of the cornerstones of historical cultural life in Israel, but it wasn't the only place. There were other kibbutzim, such as up north, Getaot, the ghetto fighters kibbutz, that have the same similar mission of educating about the Holocaust. The Israeli government, no matter which party the prime minister belonged to, has always been very strongly supportive of Holocaust education, has been involved a partner, a key partner of WJRO and its work on restitution issues and efforts. So the Holocaust has been, I think, part of the Israeli consciousness, but I think it was viewed as historical in many ways. This is what our grandparents went through. This is what happened over there in Europe. And now that reality has shifted a little bit, that, oh, something that can be spoken about in the same sentence, not the same, not comparable in many ways, but it's here and it's now. So how do the events of October 7th alter this year's observance of International Holocaust Remembrance Day? Throughout the world, I think you're going to hear a lot of linkage in a way of people saying that we can't forget what happened, the victims. So many places are involved, for example, in the reading of names, victims' names. And yet, for many of us, on a weekly basis or whenever we can, we still read the names of the hostages and try to get them returned in those efforts. So there are going to be you know, connections like that, connections made about the ongoing threat to the Jewish people, the fact that since the Holocaust 80 years ago, we haven't faced anything like this, like we're facing today, certainly in the West. In the United States, the conversation is certainly going to include the fact that Jews are in a unprecedented situation in this country in terms of anti-Semitism. The questions of people trying to erode support for the existence and legitimacy of Israel take on much more significance, especially as they become much more high profile, the attempts. They are part already of the political landscape for the forthcoming elections. AJC often cautions against comparing tragic events to the Holocaust because it risks trivializing the genocide of six million Jews. But I've heard well-meaning people make that comparison. In this case, is it a legitimate analogy? Israel as a state was able to strike back and respond in a way that Jews could not do during World War II. Governments in the West, you know, the UK, France, uh, Germany, and so on, the United States, of, of course, first and foremost, have responded forcefully, defending Jews, aligning themselves with Israel, whereas governments in the West, prior to World War II, basically ignored, accepted, or were complicit in the Nazi actions. You know, those kind of differences are significant. And the fact that, as I said, public opinion in the United States is firmly on the side of Israel compared to on the side of Hamas is also significant. So I think we have to be careful about making kind of glib historical comparisons. We're not powerless today. We were powerless in the 1930s. But that doesn't mean that our situation is not problematic and dangerous for us today. It is. And we have to recognize that. But we need to do that you know, factually and calmly and realistically. We need to find our allies and there are allies in many places, and to work together with them, because the threat to us, particularly today, from Hamas and, and allied groups like that, and their supporters, whether from the extreme left, the so-called progressives, or the extreme right, is a threat to liberal society in general. And that's something that we need to you know, be able to share and to work with our allies to turn that threat back. Mark, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and cautionary advice. Thank you very much. 
If you missed last week's episode, be sure to tune in for my conversation with Dr. Matthew Levitt of the Washington Institute as he helped us make sense of the renewed terror threat, how Iran's terror proxies Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis are coordinating their strategy, and what the U.S., Israel, and its allies are doing to fight back. Thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by AJC. Our producer is Atara Lakritz. Our sound engineer is TK Broderick. You can subscribe to People of the Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or learn more at AJC.org slash People of the Pod. The views and opinions of our guests don't necessarily reflect the positions of AJC. We'd love to hear your views and opinions or your questions. You can reach us at peopleofthepod at AJC.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to tell your friends, tag us on social media with hashtag People of the Pod, and hop on to Apple Podcasts to rate us and write a review to help more listeners find us. Tune in next week for another episode of People of the Pod.